is what I We give all the glory to our Heavenly Father. We praise Him for a glorious opportunity to hear from Him. We thank Him for sustaining our lives. And I do know that He has a good agenda for our lives. It is a beautiful privilege for us to sit together or stand together or whatever you're doing that we might share from the Word of God. Just in a moment... Shall we pray? Our good Lord, we give you the glory. We praise you for an opportunity like this. Thank you because, Lord Jesus, you are the coming king. And, Lord, your perfect will is that you will come to meet a pure church. Your perfect will is that you will come and see a ready church. People who are ready to make heaven. Our Lord, I begin to pray this day that you open our eyes and bless our hearts through your word. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I would like to share with you this day from the book of Genesis. Go with me to the book of Genesis chapter 31. I want to begin to read from verse 22. Or probably some scattered verses. In Genesis chapter 31 from 22. I read. When it was told Laban. On the third day that Jacob had fled. Then he took his kinsmen with him. And pursued him a distance of seven days. And he overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. And God came to Laban the Aramean. In a dream of the night. And said to him, be careful that you do not speak to Jacob, either good or bad. And Laban caught up with Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country. And Laban with his kinsmen camped in the hill country of Gilead. I want to jump and read verse 30. And now you have indeed gone away because you have longed greatly. For your father's house. But. Why did you steal my God? Very funny. Why did you steal my God? Let me read on. Verse 31. Then Jacob answered and said to Laban. Because I was afraid for I said. Lest you would take your daughters from me by force. The one with whom you find your God shall not leave. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what is yours among my belongings and take it by yourself. For Jacob did not know that Rachel has stolen them. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and to Leah's tent and into the tent of the two men, but he did not find them. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household idols and put them in the camel's saddle and she sat on them. And Laban fell through all the tents but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you for the manner of women is upon me. So he searched but did not find the household idols. Many years ago, it was, Jacob served Laban. And at the time, he started looking for settlement. 
He wanted to be settled. And he, after talking with his father-in-law, he decided to move to the land of settlement with members of his household. And he started going with a big entourage. And women were there. His entire family, he started moving out to the land of settlement with them. And Laban heard. Well, let me pause to say this, my dear listener. I have intentionally decided to sandwich my topic in the midst of this message. I am just, hold on a moment. You will, you will, you will realize the topic as we go along. But then we are moving to the land of settlement. And I believe right where you are sitting or standing. You are expecting the Lord to say to you. And it shall be your portion. He will surely say to you. I say he will surely say to you. I do not know how. I do not know when. But I know that I know that I know. He will. He will. Because he will say to you. And so when they were moving to the land of their settlement. Laban heard that he had gone with the children. And the wife. Who incidentally we are the daughters. Then they moved. And when they moved. He caught them on the road. When he met them, well, he spoke to them and I want to draw your attention to what he said. He said something in verse 30. You have gone away because you long greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my God? When I read this, I laughed. And I said in my heart, this kind God capable of being stolen. It's not qualified to be God. How can a God be stolen? Could you imagine? Oh, Mr. God, where were you when you were stolen? The God that was supposed to protect people is here by being stolen. I am glad. I do not worship the kind of God that could be stolen. Mm. No, 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 no. Far it be from me that I will reduce myself to such a level where I will worship the kind of God that could be stolen. How can you pack out of the yard? You are moving from your home to a new home and you move your God alongside with you. And you pack your God in a bag. Pack your God and carry your God in a vehicle. I don't want to worship the kind of God I can carry. But I want to worship the kind of God that can carry me. The kind of God that I will say in the hollow of his hands. I am relaxed. Well, here, he was saying, why did you steal my God? And, well, it's interesting to note what Jacob answered. Verse 32, Jacob says something. He said, the one with whom you find your gods shall not leave. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what is yours among my belongings. And take it for yourself. Brother, I want to remind you. Jacob was sure of the people he was moving with. Do I put it this way? He thought he was sure. Do you know that you don't know any man? Can you tap your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I don't know you? Come on. Tell that person by your side, I don't know you. Oh yes. It doesn't matter who the person is. It may be your husband, maybe your wife, maybe your brother, your sister, your boss, your servant, whoever it is, your pastor. It doesn't matter the type of person that you are standing with. It doesn't matter the person that you're moving with. You don't know, you do not know that man or woman. Oh yes. The man may decide to hide. The man may decide to play the actor. But here, Jacob thought he knew the people he was moving with. He therefore boldly told the father-in-law, the one with whom you will find your gods shall not leave. He thought, come shine, come rain. It was unthinkable for any person, any member of his entourage to mess with the God of the Father. He didn't know that he did not know those he thought he knew. Do I put it again? He didn't know that he did not know those he thought he knew. He thought, I tell you brethren, Jacob was ready to swear. Jacob was ready to vow to say, I am sure, I know, that I know, that I know, that this man, or this woman, or this my people cannot mess with their fathers, or their grandfathers, God. But the Bible says, 
Jacob did not know <laughs> that Rachel, oh my God, who is Rachel? Not just another member of the family, not just a wife, a sweetheart, very precious somebody, somebody he could trust, somebody he could rely on, somebody he could swear for, somebody he thought cannot and cannot and can never and will never do what he, she did. Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the household idols. Oh my God. And you know what? They decided to declare as such. I pray this day as you listen to this message. That divine such light shall be beamed on you. That divine such light. Because it is time for divine such light. It is time for us to allow divine such life. Forget about the testimony of the pastor concerning you. Yes, yes, yes. He has a big testimony because of you, because you are the main financier of the church. Forget about what your husband says about you. You are sister angel before your husband. Forget about that. Forget about what your wife says about you. You are angel Gabriel before your wife. That's not what we are talking about. Because man is limited. Man do not know your thinking. Man do not know your heart. Man do not know the secret that you have loaded somewhere. Man describes you from what he apparently sees. Man talks about you from what you manifest before him. But there is a hidden aspect of your life which you have not manifested before him. And that's why the people are voting for you. And that's why the people are saying you are the man. That's why the people are saying you are the woman. If it was an election, I believe, Jacob would have voted for the wife. That the wife wouldn't have done that. But he did not know. And they started searching. They came searching. And let me tell you, Vernon, as they started searching here, a day shall come when they will be thorough searching. <laughs> and when they started searching, they went into Leah's tent, into the tent of the two maids. But they did not find them. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. You know what? Rachel stole. The household idol. And the Bible says, I wish you had seen me in a VCD or in a video. You would have watched me demonstrate how Rachel did it. Nobody knew that Rachel was a member of a popular club that exists in every church called Fast Guys Club. Oh yes, Rachel was a member of, in fact, a very, pop, a very big member of that club, Fast Guys Club. She took it and sat on it. <laughs> I mean, she sat on it. And that brings me to the topic before I move on. Can you hold your neighbor by your side? And look into the eyes of your neighbor right now. Ask your neighbor. Well, it doesn't matter whether it's a male or female. Just, I crave your indulgence that you call that your neighbor Rachel. Can you call your neighbor Rachel? And ask your neighbor, Rachel, what are you sitting on? Come on, ask your neighbor that question. Rachel, what are you sitting on? Oh yes. Rachel! sat on that stolen idol. Hmm. Probably, she could be sitting on that idol and still singing hallelujah. She could still be sitting on that if we are today and still talking in tongues. She sat on that stolen idol. Oh my God. I know. When they started searching, members of this club are so wonderful. They have sweetness in their tongues. They know how to logically present their case. You know what? She told the father. He said, please, let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you. For the manner of women is upon me. In other words, Papa, my dear father, it's a pity that I could not just stand up. I am just passing through my monthly menstrual period. The manner of women is upon me. Consequently, it will be unethical, so to say, for me to stand up. So I cannot stand up. Which husband will not believe Rachel? Which wife, which, 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 which father will not believe Rachel? The whole world may believe you, but that does not mean you're right. The whole church may believe you, but that does not mean that you're sincere. People that you present, people that you presented your argument before may have believed you. They may have voted for you. They may have exonerated you. They may say you are right. But I'm asking one question this day. 
Rachel, what are you sitting on? Mm -mm. I don't want to know your position in the church. Thank you, sir, Lord Bishop. Thank you, General Overseer, Right Reverend, Full Reverend, Center Reverend. Thank you for Dickin, Arch Dickin. Thank you for Elder, Chairman of Elders. Thank you for Chief Usher. Thank you for Protocol Officer. Thank you for all the position we parade about in the church. But permit me to ask you this question. What are you sitting on? Mm -hmm. There's something you may be sitting on that no person knows. Something you may be struggling with. You are sitting on it. But people call you name. They call you Brother Pentecost. They call you Sister Holy Ghost. But you are sitting on something. A stolen idol. Something stolen from Egypt. Something stolen from Seder. Look at what Jacob said. Jacob said, in the presence of my kinsmen, point out what is yours among my belonging. Oh my God. Are you a heavenly candidate? You want to go to heaven? Are you sure you want to go to heaven? Then I want to tell you, can you lift up your hands? Can you be bold before the devil and say, devil, I challenge you. Point out what is yours among my belonging. In my business, point out what is yours. In my secret life, point out what is yours. In my thoughts, point out what is yours. Can you do that? Can you tell the devil, I'm asking you this question. Are you sure there is nothing that belongs to the devil that you have in your possession? Are you sure there is no thing that belongs to the devil that you're practicing? Are you sure? It doesn't matter what you do in the church. Jacob said, oh, point out what is yours in the presence of my kinsmen. Here we find out the woman was logical. She said, it is happening unto me. Of course, they came and sighed and they could not even find anything because she was a fast guy. Fast guys. These are days. You know, fast guys, I think I said this in one of my texts. That they are not afraid of the Ten Commandments. They are only afraid of the Eleventh Commandment. And the Eleventh Commandment says, Thou shall not be caught. Make sure they don't catch you. Be smart. We're having a lot of smart people. Smart people, they do a lot of things and they escape. Men still clap for them. People still call them the man of the hour. The woman of the hour. They still pull weight. I mean, people think that in heaven they'll be the first. But here... The question today in this step is, Rachel, what are you really sitting on? Mm. What are you sitting on? Rachel was a member of the First Guys Club. Uh, and let me share with you other two members of this club before I come back to this message. Ekan was a member of this club. Ekan. Ekan. Look at Ekan. Look at his language. You know, first guys, when they do a thing, even if the committee will invite them to come and see the committee for what they did, the way they will logically present their argument, the committee may end up, to, uh, you know, may end up apologizing, saying we are sorry that we invited you to come and see us without substantiating our, you know, uh, whatever, whatever. That's first guys. They have sweetness in their tongue. Sweetness. Look at Eka. God says something in the book of Joshua. He says something in the book of Joshua. And I want to remind you of what God said in the book of Joshua. That Achan messed with. Because he was a member of the first guys club. In the book of Joshua. If you go with me to the book of Joshua chapter 7. Look at Joshua chapter 7. We can begin to read from um, 16. And so Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel nearby tribes. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah near. And he took the family of the Zerahites. And he brought the family of the Zerahites near by man. And Zabdi was taken. And he brought the household near by man. And Achan, son of Kami, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel. And give praise to him and tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. I want to explain to you what Achan did. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly, I have sinned against the Lord and the God of Israel and this is what I did. In other words, Achan, this, Achan was saying, this is what I've been sitting on. 
Achan committed this atrocity and was sitting on it. And because he was sitting on it, Israel was defeated by the lowly rated people of Ai. Because of what somebody, a member of the Fast Guys Club, was sitting on. And he was still there. He was sitting on it. Until this time of revolution. Until this time of divine searchlight. And look at how Achan put it. He said, When I saw, verse 21, among the spoil, a beautiful mantle from Shina, 200 shekels of silver. And let me remind you, when it talks about shekels of silver, it talks about money. And the Bible says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money has done a lot of havoc. Especially, the love of money has done a lot of havoc, even in the ecclesiastical circle, and in the secular world today. He says, that when I saw it, I took 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold, 50 shekels. I took them. They are concealed in the earth. He said, I coveted them and took them. And they are concealed. King James Version will say, I saw it. I coveted them. I took them. And I hid them. Four steps. First guy. When he saw them, he coveted them. It's not wrong seeing. Seeing is not evil. You can see mistaken. But it didn't stop there. When he saw, what are you seeing? He coveted what he was seeing. He liked what he was seeing. He wanted to have what he was seeing. He coveted them and he took them. And I want to tell you there was a distance between uh, 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 coveting and taking. Yes, he would have rebuked it at that point of sight. When the devil started speaking, he would have said, no, I won't, I won't bow to you, the devil. I won't listen to what you are saying. He coveted them. Then he took them. And after taking them, he said, it's good for me to hide them. Let me hide. And he took it. He hid it. Hid it from men, but exposed before the Almighty God. Mm -hmm. No wonder the singer say, you cannot hide it from God. You may cover your sin so that no bishop will know. That the church members will not know. That the whole earth will not know. That everybody will swear for you. But there is somebody who sees in the darkest dark. Somebody that cannot be deceived. You cannot hide yourself, your true self. You can't hide yourself from him. So Achan saw. Achan took. Achan hid. Oh yes. He saw. He coveted. He took it. He hid it. And that was the way he died. That's a fast guy. I don't know what they have been hiding. I don't know what you have been hiding. I don't know what you have been, you know, intelligently sitting on. I, I chose my word carefully. I don't know what you have been intelligently sitting on. What you have, you know, played the game with. Something you have carefully covered. I mean, something that you, you, you make sure no human being will know. Uh, uh, let me remind you that the men you are hiding that thing from, they are not the final judge. The pastor that you are hiding from, the committee you are hiding from, the fellow men and women that you are hiding those things from, the thing you are tightly sitting on, and you are hiding it from men and women, and you do not want any person to realize, any person to know, they are not the final judge. God's judgment will not be democratically decided. Do you hear what I said? God's judgment will not be democratically decided. Oh yes. We're not going to vote for it. We'll not say, okay, majority carries the vote. If majority say you are a good guy, okay, you go to heaven. That's not what we're talking about. Oh yes. For what is popular may not be right and what is right may not be popular. Oh my. The good man may not be popular. The good man may not be acceptable to the people. But let me tell you something. I, 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 as I leave a can, a member of this first guy's club, I move to a man. When I talk about him, it beats my mind. I am sure this would have been the greatest anointed man that we could read in history, as far as the Bible is concerned. What am I talking about? When Elisha served Elijah, at the end of the day, Elisha had a double portion of the spirit that was upon Elijah. My brethren, it was therefore logical that Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, 
should have a quadruple portion of the spirit that was upon Elijah. In fact, he was to have a four times Elijah's anointing. You know what it means? You know, Elisha was so dynamic. Look at what happened in Elisha's ministry and life. Can you imagine if the Lord decides to bestow upon Gehazi four times such anointing? I mean, that would be something else. But this man ended his own destiny. Oh yes. It was a great tragedy. What really happened? Naaman was healed. Naaman was a top notcher in the government of the day. In the governmental circle of the day. And he came, you know, he was a leper. He came to the man of God, Elisha. And by the word of God, Elisha, through the grace of God, healed Naaman. And the Bible said in 2 Kings chapter 5, from verse um, 15, that when he returned to the man of God with all his company, he came and stood before him and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. So please take a present from me now, from your servant now. And he said, he said, I mean, Naaman said, uh, sorry, Elisha said, As a lordly before whom I stand, I will take nothing. Can you imagine? In this age, when pastors and some preachers, when you come to book them, they will give pre place price tag. On their booking they will tell you the amount you're, go you're going to deposit i mean they will tell you the amount you're going to pay i've seen people who charge per night they say you if i preach for three nights each night you you pay me this i've seen people you have to pay for ticket you have to book them before you see them on counseling well i i am not just speaking by guesswork push me to the wall and i'll give you specific instances however here in this type of age, we are people place monetary value on everything, almost everything. Neman rejected. I mean, Neman's gift was rejected by Elisha. Elisha said, Take your gift. I am not going to accept anything. I won't accept anything from you. He pressed him, added pressure to him. He refused to accept anything. Well, let me rush to what I was actually going to. Gehazi, a member of the first guy's club. He sat under Elisha. But he refused to be influenced by Elisha's ministerial principle. Just like somebody can pass through a university and the university will not pass through the person. So also somebody can pass through a church and the church will not pass through somebody. Somebody can pass through a mighty man of God and the, the ministry of the man of God may not pass through the person. Can you imagine somebody who was very close to an anointed man, Elisha? Yet, he decided to sit under something. There was something he wanted to be his God. He was sitting under this. He was a fast guy in his club. He said, oh, my master was too easy on me, man. He was too easy. I can't take this. Oh, this man. Do you know what you're doing? If you keep on rejecting things like this, the kind of house you're missing the ministry build. Are you sure you're going to build them? The kind of cars that you're missing the ministry have. Are you sure you're going to do it? The kind of achievement your mates have. Are you sure you're going to do it? He said, I will show you that I'm a fast guy. And so Gehazi pursued the name man. When I read this, what was he pursuing? He was pursuing the rejected. He was pursuing those things. I want to ask you a question this day. What are you pursuing? Secretly, in your heart, what are you pursuing? And let me warn. Any moment you begin to pursue the rejected, things God and men of God have rejected, you are looking for leprosy at the end of the day. Hear me again. Any moment you begin to pursue the rejected, things that have been rejected by the word of God, things that have been rejected by God himself, things that have been rejected by the people of God, and you are pursuing them secretly, zealously, with every zeal and zest, you are looking for leprosy at the end of the day. He pursued him until he saw Naaman. And when Naaman stopped, look at how logical his word is. Naaman said, it's all well. He said, yes. Look at lie. First kind. My master has sent me saying, 
Behold, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothes. Can you imagine him telling a lie? This was logical. That two people came and the master sent him. First guys, they have sweetness in their tongue. But when he came, Naaman gave him what he wanted. And he moved with them. He went with them, hid them. Hiding is always a key word. A memory vast of members of fast guys club. They want to hide. They want to hide. They want to hide. They want to play the actor. And so when he stood before the master, Elisha said to him, Where have you been Gehazi? You see, I see here that was where he missed his final opportunity. This would have been an opportunity for him to repent before the master and say, I am sorry for what I did. My master, forgive me for what I did. I promise I will not do that again. Where have you been? Was the question. Just like that day, God asked Adam, where are thou? Where are thou? Where are thou? Here. The master said, where have you been? And you know what he said? Your servant went nowhere. That was how he sealed his own doom. I went nowhere. Dear listener, are there opportunities you have had to repent? Are there opportunities you have had to confess your sins and reconcile with the Lord? And you are still telling more lies to lengthen your iniquity, to seal it up, to make sure you are a candidate of hell. He said, where have you been? He said, your servant went nowhere. Then he said, did not my heart go with you? When the man turned from his chariot to meet you, is it a time to receive money and to receive clothes and olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? Therefore, oh my God, let me paraphrase it this way. Instead of the intended four times anointing of Elijah upon you, instead of intended glorious ministry upon your life, instead of glorious anointing of the Lord, prepared to bestow upon you. Therefore, the leprosy of Nehemiah, the leprosy of Nehemiah shall not, it shall not depart from you. They shall cleave to you and to your descendants forever. Rachel, what are you really sitting on? My brother, Achan died shamefully. Gehazi had leprosy. Something dangerous is coming your way. Except to repent. This is the day of good news. This is the day of reconciliation. This is the day of repentance. Rachel, what are you sitting on? And that reminds me the definition of an idol. What is an idol? An idol is anything or person that has taken the seat of God in your heart. Anything at all. Any person at all that has taken the seat of God. That you obey more than God. You respect more than God. You revere more than God. So that if the person tells you to do something and God tells you to do another thing, you pick that of the person and drop that of God. I was reading one day in the book of 2nd King, chapter 17, verse 33. The Bible says, this people, I think I better read it, dear listener. Rachel, what are you sitting on? Go with me to 2nd King 17, 33. Oh, Jesus. Search my heart today. Search my heart today. 2nd King 17, 33. Let's just look at what the Bible says. Second Kings 33. They fear the Lord and serve their own gods. According to the custom of the nation from among whom they had carried, they have been carried away into Israel. They feared the Lord, but they still served their own gods. They feared the Lord. And they sang in the choir, but they still, you know, there was still a God that we are serving. They passed all the churches. He said, pastor, but there's still a God he is serving. I mean, he's a big man in the church, but there's still a God that he is serving. So, the question is, what are you sitting on? Come to the altar of reconciliation today because there is danger ahead. There are things that you can begin to serve. Number one is money. Somebody can begin to serve, you know, money. Serve it. 
That's why somebody can adulterate to get money. Somebody can tell a lie to get money. You can compromise your faith to get contract. You can use false measurement. You know what? I was reading about, my prayer for you is that God shall give you dominion over money. In the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, when I mean dominion over money, let me tell you what happened in the Bible. There's a man I respect so much. He's a man I saw in the scripture that had dominion over money. Who was he? Peter. Look at Peter. Peter went to the beautiful gate and asked for apostle chapter 3. And you know what? They looked at them and said, give us arms. They were looking for arms. The man was actually looking for arms. But Peter said, silver and gold have we not i don't want to believe that peter was hiding or telling a lie or peter was trying to spiritualize it i want to say that peter was real he had no money in the pocket that's what i believe and it's scriptural oh yes somebody can still be anointed without money in the pocket it is still it is still possible somebody can still you know somebody can still perform miracles and sometimes you know you're looking for money but I will not force you to begin to do funny things to make money by all means. Oh yes, that's the master's work. After all, the Lord said, freely you have received, freely give also. But Peter said, silver and gold have we not, but what we have we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and work. But that's not the end of the story. Peter went to Samaria, started laying hands on people. And they started receiving the Holy Spirit baptism. And somebody saw them. Somebody saw power demonstrated. Somebody saw anointing demonstrated. And I believe, and he came to Peter and said, let me offer you money so that you can give me some of the gifts, so that uh, some of this anointing that you have, so that any person I will lay my hands on shall receive the Holy Spirit. Let me use it in a present day language. Man of God. Oh, there's a dynamic anointing upon your life. I want to sow this seed into your ministry so that you can make an impartation upon me. Yes, in other words, let me sort of buy this particular gift with my money. Let me sow this seed. They can even use Pentecostal jargon to cover it up. Let me sow this seed into your ministry so that you can. I sow the money, then you give me the anointing. So that whoever I will lay my hands on shall receive the Holy Ghost. Peter, who had dominion over money, you know what Peter said? Your money perish with you. For you think you can buy the gift of God with money. Church, has this verse changed? Has this principle changed? Can somebody buy the gift of God with money? Can you buy the gift of God with money? Oh yes. Can you buy? That's it. the question I want to ask the present day church. Can you buy the gift of God with money? Can you buy anointing with money? You cannot buy anointing with money. Yes, go anywhere from Genesis to Revelation. You cannot buy anointing with money. He said, thy gift perish with you. For you think you can buy the gift with money. Oh my God. Peter had dominion over money. Peter said, don't know money in my pockets. But that will not begin to... Peter was saying, it is not time for anointing merchandise. It's not time for anointing merchandise. How are you making your money? Thank God you have seven cars on your fleet, but how are you making them? That's a question. How are you making your money? Thank God for a lot of things you are doing. You are rich. Blessed be the name of the Lord for that. But I'm still asking you, how are you making them? How are you making them? Are you exploiting the people to get rich? Rachel, what are you sitting on? Judgment day is terrible. Judgment day is coming. And so, I don't know what is your own God. Your God, your idol could be business. You separate God from your business. You run into trouble. How can you? Because you are living in a foreign land. You cannot even, you know, you don't have time to attend fellowship, but you have time to attend the party. If it is party, you bring out your time. But when it is fellowship time, you said, I got no time. I got to pay my bill. I got to do this. Oh, yes, you got to pay your bill. But at the same time, God gave you the life. God gave you the period. And if God allows sickness to come upon you, both bill and your job will be lost. Nobody can find time, but you can make time for God. Nobody can find time. You know, your job can become your God. 
Your job can become your God. So much so that you don't want anything. You don't want to say, God, stay clear of my job. Are you saying that? Are you saying, I, I bless God for things that happen in the Western world. Somebody may be privileged to call off his job. And it will not affect you. You call off your job so that you can have a retreat with God. You call off your job so that you can be useful unto God. But when you are too busy, making money, making pounds, talent, making dollars, making naira, you are too busy for God. Too busy, say, God, mind you, don't tamper with my business. It's a dangerous ground. You know, somebody, you can also be worshipping a hero. Hero worship. Is there a personality that you worship? Oh, yes. You can still be there. Your problem can still be an idol to you. Your problem. You don't have a baby. And that's all. You are not happy again. You no longer worship God because of that. Are you the first person that has ever passed through that? Now, listen to me. I know some great servants of God. They pray for others and they get healed. They pray for others and they get the fruit of the womb. But to themselves, no fruit of the womb coming forth. Yet they are still preaching. And they are still saying the Lord is good. Let me tell you, if you backslide... Because of that problem you have. You are not the only person that had that problem. Others had had that problem and they still went ahead worshipping God. They said the Lord is still good. I don't know. So what are you sitting on? What are you secretly doing? Trying to help yourself. Looking for help where there is no help. Trying to deviate from the authentic faith. Once delivered unto you by the Holy Spirit. And great servants of the Lord. What are you sitting on? What has befallen you? What has come? What has happened upon your life? What are you sitting on? I don't know something that has bewitched you. I don't know something that you worship now as an idol. A stolen idol. Your own may be home video. Thank God for home video. I'm not against it. There are some lessons to learn from it. But when you begin to worship it, you can't give God 30 minutes prayer. But you can worship home video for 3 hours at a stretch. You can worship home video. You can begin to look at television, worship television. That's what you're sitting on right now. It has entered into your fabric. It has entered into your arteries and veins. So that it has become the center of your life. Influencing everything you do. No wonder you are running a family that is video centric. You are running a family that is film centric. And the Lord is taken out of the way. Hear me this day. Rachel, what are you sitting on? What is that idol? What is that idol? What is that I do? That thing that is eating you up. That thing that you have, you have become addicted to. That thing. That secrecy. That secretive thing that you are doing. That is the question. What are you really sitting on? Yes. It is an important question we must ask ourselves. Questions we must answer. Look at Abraham. Abraham demonstrated that a child can never be an idol to him. Abraham had no child. When the baby came, Abraham had a voice. Abraham! Abraham! Arise. Take Isaac, your only son, whom you love. Go and sacrifice unto me. And Abraham, could you imagine? I want to suppose like I shared the other time, I doubt if Abraham told the wife. Because the wife could rebuke the voice and call it a demon. Say, so how can you hear a voice that will tell you? Go and sacrifice the only son that we have. You know, there are demands God may make on you as a person. The second party may not understand it. There are certain demands the Lord may make on you. A second party will not understand it. A second party may not understand it. But Abraham decided to obey God. Look at the summary of it. I don't want to get into detailed exposition of this passage. The summary of it is this. In Genesis 22, Abraham was saying, I have a relationship with God. God is first in my life, with or without child. Now that a child has come, I don't want anything to come between me and God. I don't want anything to be an idol to me. I want to give my whole self. I want to give my whole life. So Abraham, Abraham obeyed. Without even discussing it with any person. He went to obey God. So Rachel, the question is what are you sitting on? I do not know what you have decided to sit on. 
I don't know what you have decided to sit on. What are you sitting on that is stopping the movement of the Spirit of God in the church? What are you sitting on that is stopping the flow of the anointing in your life? What are you sitting on that has stopped you from becoming fully what God intends you to be? What are you sitting on that is bringing catastrophe in your family? What are you sitting on that you don't want to share, you don't want to bring out, you don't want to repent of? What are you sitting on that have brought terrible things, untold hardship to you? Oh, God wants to see, God wants to send revival. This is the time of revival. I am expecting mighty revival. We are expecting great revival. But the problem of God is that there are still people sitting on something, stolen idol. Let me say this. If you go ahead sitting on that stolen idol, if you stand up and expose it now, it will be good. It will be good for your own safety. If you keep sitting on it, what you are sitting on will become a time bomb. Hear me this day. I speak to you by the authority of the word of God. That thing you are sitting on will soon become a time bomb. It will explode under your buttocks. And when it explodes, uh, I mean, it will rubbish you. It will bring shame. It will distribute you shamefully all over the nations. And they will see your inner part. You better treat it. You better handle it now. You better handle it, Rachel. Stop sitting on a stolen idol. It will destroy you. It will destroy your destiny. It will destroy your future. It will hinder you. It will hinder you. I see greatness upon you. I see mighty blessing that the Lord wants to release upon you. I see God wanting to settle you. Oh, sister, your day of settlement is coming. Brother, your day of visitation has come. But the Lord is saying, you must get out of what you're sitting on. I mean, you must bring out what you're sitting on. As long as you're sitting on that. And let me go back to my test and show you something. Listen to me. As long as Rachel was sitting on that stolen idol, she could not stand up. As long as Rachel was sitting on that stolen idol, she could not move forward. She will be static there. And let me tell you, in your business, in your spiritual life, in your marital life, as long as you're sitting on that stolen idol, you cannot move forward. As long as you're sitting on that stolen idol, you cannot become what God wants you to be. As long as you're sitting on that stolen idol, that expectation of yours will be dashed to the rock. As long as you're sitting on that stolen idol, you are messing up your future. Oh my God. You are messing up your own food. Oh yes. Because the Lord knows you. The Lord knows you. He knows you. He knows you. He knows your name. He knows everything about you. He knows. He knows you. This is the day. This is a day of greatness. A day when the Lord wants to accomplish mighty things in your life. A day when God wants to bring. And, and, and let me tell you something. God wants to do a new thing in your life this day. You cannot hide. Where will you hide from it? David said, where will I hide from the Lord? Where? Where do I think I can hide from the Lord? If I run to the mountains, can I do that? I cannot run away from him. No, no, no. It's not possible for you to run away from him. You must bring your idols since you cannot run away from this God. We've got to fear him. He who has the heavens and the earth. If you look at Psalm 139, I think I'm going to round up at that particular passage. I want to take you to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Open your Bible. That's the final authority. It is a canon. It is the rule of law for those who are heavenly candidates. Psalm 139. I want us to read Psalm 139. Look at how the psalm is posted. Psalm 139 from verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thought from afar. Verse 3. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down. You know, I can lie down and people may think that I'm sleeping when I am plotting evil. But thou know it. Jehovah, thou know it. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways, which my pastor and my leaders do not know. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways, which my dear wife does not know, which my friends do not know. Though they may be hailing me because they do not know me, but oh God, when I come before you, you are intimately acquainted with all my ways. 
Even before there's a word on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, thou dost know it all. Thou hast reckoned me behind and before. And laid thy hand upon me. Mm. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high, I cannot attain it. And verse 7 asks a very dear question. Where can I go from thy spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Where can I go? Where can I flee? Oh, even as I'm lying down, the voice of God in my heart, Mr. Conscience, is still there talking about what I did yesterday, talking about what I did last month, talking about what I did last year, and last month, and last week. Where can I run from your presence? And he began to, uh, the psalmist began to, you know, he began to think in his heart. He said, if I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in sure, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the down, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me, and thy right hand will hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to thee. If I get into a dark room, if I put out a light and do anything I want to do, even the darkness will not be darkness to God. Because in the darkest of dark is the invisible eye. Where will I run from your presence? If I rush to Japan, you are dear. I move to Russia, you are dear. I go to the United Kingdom, you are dear. I go to the remotest part of the United States, you are dear. I go to Asia, you are dear. I move to Australia. Where can I run from your presence? Since I cannot run away from you, oh God. Since I cannot run away from your presence. The best thing is to pay you. Because judgment is very fearful, brethren. The day shall come when the secret of every heart shall be revealed. The day shall come when your true story, mm -mm, your true story, your true color shall come out. Judgment day is coming when all men shall appear before the throne of grace. Righteous! It will not last. What you are sitting on will not last. It will soon be revealed. Oh my God. Let me tell you one dangerous thing. There are people whose sins move before them. To eternity. What am I saying about? That is a better one. Mm -hmm. But if your sin comes behind you. It's very dangerous. If your sin is revealed before you die, while you are still alive, and, and, and you, you, your sin is revealed before, when you are still alive, you treat it when you are still alive, it is better for you. If you hide it until you die, and it follows you to eternity, that's too dangerous, man. This is the hour of reconciliation. Bow your heads in prayer. Oh my God. I want you to open up to the Lord this hour. Tell him what you are really sitting on. Confess it to him. If, if Gehazi had made use of that opportunity. If Gehazi had reconciled. No wonder. The psalmist said in verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thought. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting life. Are you having a hopeful way in you? Rachel, what are you sitting on? Our Father, I give you the glory. I give you the praise. I worship you for this message. Oh Lord. We cannot hide ourselves from you. Just as we are without one plea. You, you are. You are the final judge. Lord, I begin to pray for every listener. Is there any man or woman who is willing to think about what he or she has been sitting on? Lord Jesus, you said if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness. Lord, I begin to pray that you begin to reveal yourself. I'm asking for your mercy. I'm asking for your forgiveness. As this person begins to repent, as this person begins to confess to you, oh Lord, I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for your cleansing. Asking for your washing. 
that a new wind of revival will come upon this person. He's been killing people for a long time and he's been sitting on it, committing abortion for a long time and been sitting on it. He's been committing atrocity for a long time and today, Father, as he or she repents, have mercy, O Lord. Have mercy to the glory of your holy name. We give her the glory, we give her the praise. Thank you, Lord, as you forgive. Thank you, Lord, as you cleanse. Hallowed be thy name, O God. Mm, let a new thing come. I know. Let a wind of settlement come. For the stolen idol have gotten out of the way. Oh God. And you might begin to fulfill what you have said. The ministry that you have revealed. Thank you Lord for answer prayer. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. You have been listening to your brother. Chidi Okorafu. Well in case you have been blessed by this message. You want to talk with me on the telephone. Our office number is. 088-224-109 or 088-222-475 or the cell phone number 080-330-76980 In case you want to write, you can also write Box 1990, Omaha, Nigeria. Box 1990, Omaha, Nigeria. Remember, if you are calling from outside the country, our country code is 234. So if you are calling me, it can be 234 8822 275. 234 8822 475. And you want to talk to me on the email? Chi at hotmail.com. Or A-G-O-D-I-C-T-4. At 64 at yahoo.com. God bless you. We are praying for you. We are available for revival and conferences and programs. God bless you abundantly. I believe Rachel will no longer be sitting on stolen idol. God bless.